Okay, welcome everyone uh, to our spring 2021 distinguished lecture series uh, jointly organized by Department of Religious Study and Ariel Graduate Council and sponsored by Institute, of, Institute for the Study of Humanistic Buddhism, University of West. And my name is Miro Sakya, Chair of the Department of Religious Study. And today I'm honored to have the privilege to introduce our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. John Campbell. Dr. Campbell holds a doctorate degree in religion from Columbia University with a specialization in Indo-Tibetan Buddhist, study, Buddhist studies. And he's an independent scholar, accomplished yogin, and translator of Sanskrit and Tibetan texts. His main area of research are practice system of yoga and tantra in Indo-Tibetan Buddhism and Hinduism. He's currently writing a book on the commentarial literature of Buddhist, Buddhist and Hindu tantric Buddhist practice system in late first millennium India. And a former assistant professor of Buddhist studies at the University of Virginia, Charlevet Will, among other academic institutes, he teach graduate and undergraduate course in the theory and practice of yoga, both contemporary and pre-modern Buddhist philosophy in India and Tibet, and survey of culture and religion in Southeast and Himalayan Asia. He's currently a currently director of Sanskrit projects for the Asian classical input project, developing the digitization of classical Sanskrit texts on Buddhist and Hindu scriptural science. He also advised research of advanced graduate student in UVA's renowned Buddhist studies doctoral program. And today, Dr. Campbell is going to give a talk about his new book titled The Esoteric Community Tantra with the illuminating lamp. And it has a, uh, a translation of uh, the first 12 chapter of this Guhe Samadha Tantra, along with the commentary called Pradipo Dyoptana Namatika, a commentary in Sanskrit by the 17th century Buddhist scholar, Chandrakirti. And in this talk, uh, Dr. Campbell will provide an introduction to the scripture and commentary by Master Chandrakirti both of which provide enormously influential in the development of Mahayana Buddhism throughout Tibet, the Himalayas, and Mongolia. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Campbell. Close. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction, um, Professor Shakya and uh, my friend Niroj. The, uh, this is, as usual, um, uh, uh, such a delight to, to join you and your graduate students uh, and, uh, and I'm very honored to be asked and to have this opportunity to talk about this, um, this new translation, this publication. Uh, and I'd just like to add that I'm particularly honored and actually a little bit intimidated by the presence of <laughs> Professor Lewis Lancaster, who is a, um, uh, you know, it's a little bit like if I were an actor and then Sean Connery showed up in the, uh, you know, in the, in, in my, in my, in my screen test. Um, so I'll, uh, anyway, it, it's, it's wonderful uh, to finally meet you, sir. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, uh, I uh, hope to, uh, at Miroj's um, request to, you know, make available maybe at uh, some student discount to you, uh, to you all the the text that is come out from <clears throat> wisdom publications, uh, and we'll be looking into that because what I'll try to cover in a brief time is, is exactly as the introduction stated uh, the the background so much as we understand about this particular scripture. And, it, and in particular, it's commentary, which is what I focused on. Uh, and then it's reception in Tibet. But the real topic overarching is interpretation, uh, or that is the topic of hermeneutics, which is a fancy word for interpretation of scripture. Uh, and I think that that is something that should be uh, of great interest to, to, to all of you as, as you know, scholars of religion and, and, and particularly if you're scholars of the Buddhist tradition. 
Um, so the text that uh, that that uh, is be that was just published is the first half of the Guha Samaja Tantra, which uh, I worked on as a graduate student uh, and actually was the basis of my my doctoral work. And there is a single Sanskrit or re remaining Sanskrit commentary. That is a commentary that the Sanskrit version of it still exists. There are a number of commentaries uh, that, came, that were produced in India on this, on this scripture, as well as a number of sub-commentaries on Chandrakirti. So let's first address uh, the scripture itself. As the Guiha Samaja Tantra is a, uh, presents, it, it presents in a very classic uh, Mahayana way, uh, a setting in which the enlightened Buddha uh, is teaching to an audience. Uh, but the twist here is that it is no longer a recogn our recognizable Shakyamuni Buddha, but is instead the uh, eternal and cosmic Buddha Vajradhara who is assembling a mandala, uh, a retinue of similarly enlightened beings and protectors and so forth around him herself. Guya Samaja is typically represented as having three faces. It's been this object of scholarly research uh, and interest since really the beginning of, uh, of modern Buddhist studies for 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 two reasons. One is it is in uh, it seems to be one of the earliest of the so-called Mahayoga tantras, uh, the more advanced yoga tantras that uh, reference the transformative practices that become known as Vajrayana. Uh, although I would argue that it is pretty much impossible to put a date on this. It certainly was uh, existed in some form in India, in circulation in India by the seventh century. And for the other reason, which is sort of maybe not such a positive reason that it caught the attention of the modern, uh, at the time, mostly European scholars of Buddhism was that it's uh, a, in a, the presentation of the Buddha in, in its, uh, let's call it an eroticized form. So at a certain point during the uh, unfolding of the scripture, the enlightened being, Vajradhara, is manifesting in a, uh, in union, um, in yogic union with a consort. And not only just Vajradhara, but there's then this whole uh, game of musical chairs where different versions of the enlightened being, whether it be Akshobhya or uh, Vairochana, will assume the middle space in the, in the tantra. Uh, and so, of course, this uh, in the history of, uh, of contemporary, of modern, I would call it anything from the 19th century, modern Buddhist studies, this, this appeared to be very scandalous. Uh, it talks about making offerings of impure substances to the Buddhas. Uh, basically, in, 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 in certain respects, every taboo uh, that would have been familiar to anyone in Sanskrit culture, the, anyone familiar with Brahminical Dharma would have been completely, uh, as I said, scandalized by this. Um, it's almost as if somebody went out of their way to mess with the, uh, the potential audience. Uh, so we have this text that on its own, if you were to read it, is in clear Sanskrit. It's not terribly difficult to translate, but to have any understanding of it, I think, is pretty much in it would be impossible. Uh, it would be almost like a, an empty placeholder for whatever you wanted to project onto it. And of course, for a long time, Orientalist scholars would project upon it their own sort of neurotic hangups about like sex and death being, you know, 
not a good thing. And, and that this was clearly an indication that the Mahayana tradition in India by the end of the first millennium had gone into a decadent period of decline, that that decadent form or uh, let's call it corrupted form of Mahayana Buddhism, which had been mixed with, uh, with, with Hindu deities and, uh, and again, scandalous practices, li uh, giving license to uh, yogic practices that had nothing to do with Buddhism, that these were finally taking over uh, in India, in the, in the Sangha, in, as well as in lay Buddhists. And it wasn't long before the whole thing fell apart due to its own internal corruption, like sort of a corrupt, uh, sort of like a rotten apple, you know, eventually just fell apart. So not surprisingly, Buddhism disappears from India. Uh, this sort of arc of decline perfectly uh, aligns as well with this notion that Buddhism at one point was with the presentation of Gautama Buddha's teaching, pure, had nothing to do with anything but the control of the mind and the transcending of suffering. Um, and that those early teachings were authentic and everything basically from the Mahayana on was an elaboration and a, and a forgery or a fraud. And that would include Mahayana sutras as well. Uh, but particularly the things get terribly out of hand with the emergence of these tantric scriptures. Uh, of course, by the 13th century, the institution of monastic Buddhism is, is virtually over in India. It's, it's literally lying in rubble. Um, and this is reported by Tibetan pilgrims who visited places like uh, Nalanda and found very few monks still residing there. This form of Mahayana Buddhism that also embraced these uh, yogic scriptures, these Mahayana, these tantric scriptures, was the was characteristic of the kind of Buddhism embraced by people in the Tibetan Himalayan plateau, as well as in uh, the Kathmandu Valley, and then beyond that into Mongolia. So that, in a nutshell, is the trope of decline and fall of Buddhism, that this scripture, if anything, is a cautionary tale about how Buddhism went terribly wrong. Well, it's an interesting contrast with the view of those uh, Buddhist uh, communities and entire cultures, such as those in Tibet, the great, greater Tibet, uh, certainly at certain times in China, during the, uh, the, uh, the Qing dynasty, Mongolia, and in the Himalayas, who believed that this was quite the opposite, that this was the crowning glory uh, uh, and expression of the Dharma. So where do you go from there? Well, it seems like the sensible thing to do is to find out what the people who are actually using the text and or the teaching thought about it what how was it how did it make sense to them and that was the premise of my doctoral work was to look at this uh influential commentary authored by somebody named i'm going to say somebody named nagarjun uh, sorry uh, chandrakirti who says at the beginning of his commentary this is what i got uh, these teachings this explanation of uh, the great glorious guya samaja from Lord Nagarjuna. For those of you who are familiar with uh, the, the Nalanda tradition of Mahayana Buddhism and exegesis in India, the, uh, the pantheon um, of, of Mahayana scholars, beginning with Nagarjuna through Aryadeva, arrives at the seventh century scholar Chandrakirti. And Chandrakirti's explanation of Nagarjuna's works then become definitive, the definitive statement of uh, middle way or centrist Madhyamika studies throughout, uh, again, Tibet and, and, and beyond. These are, this is the same philosophical view that was taken up by, Shant, uh, by Shantideva, for example. 
So right away, it's very interesting to note that whoever wrote this commentary, whether or not they were historically the same one in the same Chandrakirti, living in the seventh century, which we more or less can date because of relative uh, interactions that seem to have uh, occurred between him and other contemporaries, that at least wanted to present himself as the great Madhyamaka scholar. And that his commentary, in fact, was part of an entire interpretive set of scripture, uh, not scriptures, but shastras authored by other scholars who also were identified with these great Madhyamaka scholars. So Chandrakirti, our Chandrakirti writing about this tantric text, considered himself to be a disciple of the Madhyamaka Nagarjuna, who himself is identified in this particular tradition as an author of interpretation on the Guhya Samaja. So this presents in some respects a chronological problem because Nagarjuna is fairly reliably uh, located in the second century CE, um, Aryadeva not long after that, and Chandrakirti to the seventh century. But the full expression of these uh, advanced Mahayoga texts is not really available or, uh, or seen or present until centuries later. And this is, again, encouraged people to believe, scholars that is, that we're talking about two different Chandrakirtis and that this Chandrakirti is just sort of a later imposter. Um, again, my project was simply to see, uh, not to prove that one way or another, but to see how the idea that the Madhyamaka view that things are empty of swabhava or an existence from its own side, how that was compatible with their interpretation of these yogic scriptures, because clearly that is what they wanted to project. This entire interpretive uh, community or system that uh, Chandrakirti's was part of came to be known as the Arya tradition. And his text, as, as Miroj already, already mentioned, is known as the Pradipodyotana, which means the illumination of the lamp. And in his interpretation, it is the illuminating of something that is already a lamp. What is the lamp? The lamp is the scripture. And what does he say about it? Well, it tracks the entire scripture. It's the only commentary that we have that still exists that is a running commentary on the words and statements of the Guhya Samaja. And in doing so, he sets out an extraordinarily sophisticated interpretive framework for taking the statements, the sometimes outrageous and sometimes very perplexing statements of the scripture and giving a, uh, an interpretive scheme with which it would be possible to understand the meaning and extract the meaning. And this is where I will step back and say that this book is ultimately about in hermeneutics. Chandrakirti's project lays out in his first chapter a system of seven ornaments, he calls them, that, uh, that provide, in fact, 28 permutations of ways of interpreting the statements in the scripture. Going back to Mahayana and even earlier pre-Mahayana Buddhist interpretive practices, the particularly Mahayana interpretive uh, approach was to say something is a, you know, a scripture or a statement of the Buddha was definitive if it can be taken to be clearly meaning what it says. If it doesn't need any further interpretation, that would mean that the statement was definitive. Statements about selflessness, for example, would be definitive. Statements, however, about the path would necessarily be interpretable because they might apply differently to different, to different uh, practitioners 
And also very often the Buddha, both in the early Pali scriptures and in the Mahayana would very often refer to a, a, a person rather than deconstructing and saying, no, that person is really selfless. They would talk about the person and how to cultivate the person. These would be considered interpretive, interpretable statements. So in, as we go back to our earliest uh, statements that are, that, that are attributed to the Lord Buddha 2,500 years ago, that are placed in, I would say, placed in his mouth. The, the theme that continually uh, comes up or uh, the, the, uh, is that the Dharma that he, he taught his community was just a fraction of what was actually available, uh, but it is what they needed for their, their, uh, for their practice purposes, for them to progress along the path. And so as you, those of you who are students of the Mahayana understand and have studied that the emergence of a whole new set of scriptures, which also were cl claimed to be authored or spoken by the Buddha, but seemed to be chronologically out of sync, were explained as being the, uh, that, that the Buddha was perfectly capable of being uh, teaching in multiple places at the same time, and that certain teachings which would be only appropriate to a more mature audience would be uh, kept, not exactly in hiding, but they would be obscure. So there's the story of the perfection of wisdom, the Prajnaparamita sutras being entrusted to the Naga kingdom, for example, and only revealed much later uh, to great scholars such as Nagarjuna. The statements being too radical for the early community. So Chandrakirti's approach in this respect is completely consistent with uh, earliest Buddhist attempts to interpret or the need to interpret the statements of the Buddha. And the uh, Mahayana emphasis on how the Buddha was quite capable and in fact always presenting the Dharma in skillful ways in different places at different times. Chandrakirti's set of ornaments that he's going to use, then he uses to track the entire scripture and you, uses it to, to, to apply to different practitioners at different stages of development. And what makes this very distinct from most other exegetical systems is that in his system of seven ornaments, a single statement of the scripture might have multiple meanings depending on who it was in, who was using it. That is, if you were a beginner student, if you were an advanced student. And if I can share my screen now, um, we can just have a look at what these seven ornaments. Uh, where was I? Here we go. Is, is that coming through, Nuraj? Yes. Okay. The first of these, uh, of these interpretive ornaments, Jandrakirti says, are uh, preliminaries. Um, and the Goya Samaja, he's, and his entire Arya tradition linked to other tantric commentators, says that the Goya Samaja is so unique among these expressions of the Vajrayana because it comes with its own set of commentaries that the Buddha actually taught his own interpretive system. And these are known as explanatory tantras. They're entirely separate sets of scriptures. Um, and Chandrakirti relies heavily on them in his articulation of this seven ornament system. So these uh, preliminaries, first of all, acknowledge what the appropriate sets of scriptures are to use to interpret the esoteric community or the Goya Samaja. Um, there's the ornament number two of nyaya or methods. And this is for engaging uh, in both esoteric 
and exoteric Buddhist paths of practice modeled on the process by which the Buddha came to embody enlightenment. And in, in a certain sense, this is sort of the anthropological ornament because in exoteric Buddhist presentations of the awakening of Shakyamuni, uh, he, is, he becomes an ascetic very famously and then finally realizes that pure asceticism is not the path and not the way. It is only through taking food finally that he is able to come to his full awakening. The esoteric presentation of the Buddha's awakening involves him in that special period uh, at the Vajrasana in what is now Bodhgaya, uh, that in his deep state of samadhi, that he travels to Akanishta heaven, where he is actually initiated into tantric practice himself and realizes his full awakening before returning to his seat where he appears eventually to teach the uh, and assemble the monastic community. So the method is for understanding the method ornament then allows the, the, uh, the literate interpreter to understand how these statements of the tantra can apply equally to those who are still exclusively on the Mahayana path and following in and modeling their practice along the esoteric path, sorry, exoteric path of the Buddha. And those who are involved in the esoteric path requiring initiation and so forth. And this is also importantly, the distinction between whether they are aligning themselves with the dispassionate practice of renunciation of, uh, uh, for example, um, dispassionate as in removing themselves from desire, hatred, and ignorance, rather than the passionate practice or raga dharma of vajrasattva, who then in the tantric path harnesses these energies in order to accelerate a full transformation to a fully enlightened being. The really important interpretive core of this program are this third and fourth ornaments. The so-called koti, there are uh, parameters of explanation. They refer to different kinds of speech used in the root tantra. And the semantic levels are familiar from non-tantric Buddhist terminate, such as uh, the definitive statements versus interpretable statements. Um, these, this next fourth uh, ornament, the interpretive or vyakya, they systematize the gradual decoding of successively more profound levels of meaning encoded in the text, corresponding to the needs of the student at progressively more advanced stage of study and practice. So for example, in uh, there are four programs of interpretation. The, uh, the, there's a general statement which applies to both those on the uh, exoteric path, the Mahayana path, and those on the esoteric path. There are those statements which are to be only understood as referring to those involved in, uh, those who have been initiated into the yogic practice of self-recreation in the mandala. He defines and one, uh, the, the fifth ornament, refers to a teaching environment, specifying which modes of exposition and levels interpretation are appropriate to public teaching versus those that are only appropriate for individual instruction from a master, from a Vajracharya. And this ornament links the teaching of the advanced perfection stage practices, which are the deep manip the manipulation of the actual prana of the individual, which then becomes the basis for not just the creation of or the realization of the Mahayana Dharma Kaya, but the actual transformation of the gross 
body into that of the enjoyment body, the Sambhogakaya. There is a typology of five types of people who are taught, you know, uh, ranging from those who are barely competent, uh, but can simply attend these teachings uh, as a blessing. Um, this is actually something that the Dalai Lama, the His Holiness Dalai Lama likes to say, uh, typically at these big Kala Chakra initiations. He says, if you don't do the practice, it's still a wonderful blessing to, to, to be here. Uh, up to the, what he calls the jewel student, who is capable of actually engaging in the deep yogic practice that is outlined or extracted, particularly from these explanatory tantras. And then finally, there's <clears throat> the, uh, the ornament of performance or sadhana. And this ornament describes the perfect integration of um, the, or what's called yuganada uh, of two realities, satya, dvaya. Um, now in the Madhyamaka presentation, you'd be familiar with this idea of the two truths or two, two realities, conventional and ultimate. Distinctively in this presentation of the, the tantric path, tantric Buddhist path, those two realities are indexed or aligned with a, the clear light of the ultimate nature of mind and the transformed yogic body that is no longer a flesh and blood body, but a luminous body of light, which they call a, a maya deha or a, a magic body. So um, it, that is, I'm going to now stop sharing. I don't know exactly how to do that. Uh, oh yeah, stop, here we go. So this is what, Chandrakirti begins his treatise with. He spends his, a very lengthy first chapter linking his interpretive scheme to these auxiliary interpretive tantras or teachings, scriptures, and then moves on into chapters two through 17 to uh, do an interpretive unpacking of literally each statement in the scripture, making pass multiple passes through each statement according to the different levels of interpretation. So he will interpret one statement for those uh, fairly dull students who are really not capable of doing the practice and then returning to it and explaining something in terms of a much more advanced student who's capable of engaging in the full practice. So what is the full practice of this, of this system? Um, it involves basically, uh, or, or the core uh, piece of it and logic of it is that there are the two truths themselves align with two developmental practices of self-transformation. One of them is in harnesses imagination this is known as uh, the development stage or creation stage, where there is a, uh, a, a this is what's known as sadhana or the rep repetitive rehearsing of a perfect Buddha environment and oneself as a perfect being within that perfect Buddha environment. I don't know if you know the expression, faking it till you make it, but that is basically the core uh, logic of the sadhana and stabilizing oneself as an enlightened being, which of course, you know, from at least, you know, as an American, you're like, oh, good, I'm going to think about myself as God all the time. That, uh, you know, that's great. I already think I'm great. This is just going to make me feel like I'm even greater. The key to being a, a within the sadhana uh, context and the developmental stage is yes, to have the perception of oneself as this enlightened de uh, uh, deva, but also to cultivate, which they call, by the way, divine pride. 
but also most more importantly is to see one's environment as well as all the beings within one's environment themselves as enlightened. And so it is, it bears resemblance in my limited uh, study, for example, of Japanese Buddhism uh, as a, you know, as an undergraduate uh, to presentations such as Shinran and Nichiren who talked in the, in the various Pure Land traditions where the, 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 the practice is to work to experience and recognize that the, the Amitabha's paradise is here now. And by chanting the name of Amitabha, one, one instantiates this Dharma reality or this Dharma body. Uh, as I mentioned, there are two yogic processes. Once that creation stage, developmental stage is stabilized sufficiently. And I should say one more thing about the developmental stage. The developmental stage is so powerful because it's not simply imagination because it's easy enough, or I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's, it's, it's certainly uh, not far-fetched to sit around and imagine that you are in a, in a perfect place. But the problem is that you're not really going to believe it. You, uh, you know, I wake up in the morning and I'm like, okay, today I'm gonna have a great day, but it could be five minutes before something <laughs> changes my mind. In the practice of Kyrim or what they call Sampanna Krama, the creation stage, it is absolutely crucial that one practices it on the basis of a imagination of death the dissolution of the gross elements of the body and finally returning to a very subtle stage of mind before then the rehearsing of re-emerging into relative reality as this enlightened being. So as I was saying, going through that process sufficiently till it becomes uh, not only imaginative, not only creative and not only, uh, not only tangible, it actually starts to become real. And this is what they call the perfection stage. And this is an area that uh, is alluded to extensively in Chandrakirti's text, but not discussed in any uh, specifics. So backing up for a moment then, in the few minutes that I have left, why would Chandrakirti be a writing such a commentary with such a, a complex interpretive scheme uh, and to what end and what sort of if, and, and what sort of influence did that have? Well, I've, I've already brought up or, or questioned the, uh, the idea that this is a, a, a different Chandrakirti. What is important is that that interpretive system considers itself or wants to identify itself with the Madhyamaka philosophical view of Nagarjuna, for one. Secondly, uh, the presentation of the Guya Samaja within the context of this interpretive system locates it squarely, not only in Madhyamaka philosophy, but as a Mahayana Buddhist practice. So in a sense, it's harnessing the very uh, out, sometimes outlandish seeming um, statements of the scripture and drawing it through interpretation back into squarely into Ma Mahayana cosmology. And this is a really crucial developmental point for Tantra in India it seems because Tantra presentations suggested to some interpreters that an entirely more advanced and new philosophical view was being mooted, was being presented. Chandrakirti and his followers will say, no, that this is the, this is the view of selflessness and voidness and relativity dependent or origination that is not only squarely Mahayana, it's pre-Mahayana, it is part of the it is part of the disciple vehicle as well, or the Sharavakayana, familiar to all of them. So from this point of view, this 
emergence of a new kind of Mahayana is simply new in terms of method, in terms of powerful, accelerating methods, using a rehearsal of the death process to reemerge. And uh, as, as Robert Thurman, my, my mentor likes to say, you know, is away with words, this is basically genetic self-engineering. Uh, so to break oneself down, to reemerge as an enlightened being. By the time, and finally, I would say, because of Chandrakirti, whoever this particular Chandrakirti was, and I think it's completely plausible that it is the same author uh, as the Madhyamaka, uh, um, sorry, uh, ex exegete, um, Chandrakirti, by using that name and by affiliating with these other Madhyamaka masters, he is bringing these very uh, radical scriptures into the fold of institutional esoteric Buddhism that were, that by the time these texts are being written, not only are they being written in very high classical Sanskrit, which of course implies that you're not talking about a bunch of hippies hanging out in Goa, uh, you know, who are just doing, doing their thing, their freewheeling thing, that this is part of a monastic structured curriculum of tantric practice. And that is exactly how it will be taken as it is, as it, as it crosses the Himalayas, uh, when it's translated for the first time in about the year 980 by Rinchen's uncle. Uh, we don't have time to talk about that per se. Uh, so uh, this is where I'll, I'll conclude just by saying that the importance and the fascinating, to, to me, the fascination of the, and the brilliance of the commentary is that it is, uh, that its project, and I think very successful project, is to align this new advanced, if you will, uh, presentation of the Dharma, of selflessness, voidness, and relativity, aligning it with advanced yogic practices, but doing so in such a way that it is able to become part of Mahayana cosmology, Mahayana doctrinal uh, um, coherence, and to basically create a possi the possibility for other creative expressions, especially of, uh, of tantric scripture, to emerge. We know that after, uh, in India, you know, by the end of the first millennium, that the Guya Samaja basically sets a model for increasingly, uh, an increasing creative period of, of, of scripture production, always claiming to be the statements of the Buddha, these are known, for example, as the Yogini Tantras. But at least with the interpretive system laid out by Chandrakirti, it becomes very clear that these practices and texts and so forth somehow had to be understood as being Mahayana Buddhism. And, the la and I'll finish with saying something actually to relates to the last time that um, the that, uh, Professor Shakya hosted me. I, I gave a talk on, on uh, the, the Indian master Atisha and his, his journey to Tibet and the enormous influence that he had in Tibetan Buddhism. And the influence that I would highlight as being most pronounced was not institutional. It was, again, an interpretive influence. And that is that whatever teaching Came, comes across, you know, the, those mountains, it must be made coherent within the bodhisattva practice of wisdom and compassion. It opens the door for really what Lord Buddha seems to have been saying when he was sitting under a tree and saying, what I'm teaching you uh, and the teachings that are actually, you know, available, the Dharma is as plentiful as the leaves in this tree. And it is an opportunity then for, particularly for Tibetans, 
to, uh, for the, to, sorry, for the Tibetan tradition to develop along a lines that is a fully, immer a fully uh, mature Mahayana Vajrayana tradition of Buddhism, as well as in, in Kathmandu Valley, which I'm curious to hear about from, from Dr. Shakya. In conclusion, Chandrakirti's Pradipo Dyotana, or light on the lamp, illumination of the lamp, which can be taken in both ways, just as it is in English. You know, a lamp gives off light, but in this case, it could be read also as there's an illumination of the lamp itself. So you need to be able to even see the lamp in order to have some uh, experience of what it's showing you. Uh, and this is complex enough and detailed enough that it's, and as I've been saying, you know, it's it just is to integrate into Mahayana mainstream, very possibly new or previously unknown practices. And doing that is like, he, he is really writing a manual for Vajra masters. It, you might even call it a, uh, a Vajrayana graduate school curriculum. This is in fact how it is taken by the later Tibetan tradition, and that's a longer story, but they quite literally take it as a curriculum to be studied. So the redirecting of, uh, of the statements of the Tantra um, are what uh, is this enduring and, and amazing contribution uh, of the work. And it's only halfway translated now. We hope to continue working on it and to add to it the uh, sub-commentaries that come from the Tibetan tradition. I would like to leave now uh, some uh, time for, for discussion and questions. And thank you for, for listening. Thank you, Dr. Campbell, for a very insightful talk. So I was amazing. It's very deep. This, this book is... Uh, the question master is extremely important for the country's practice, even for Mahayana Buddhism. So in, I would like to uh, tell a little bit about Nepalese context. So ne in Nepal, we have a Nava Dharma, we call it, nine Bhaipulya Sutras, most important text. And there's one text called Tathagata Guhyeka. And that text disappeared from the world, I heard. And recently they found some fragments of that takes a professor from Sam Stanford. Uh, they Paul have Harrison was Paul saying, right. mentioned that they found something, but it's not complete or something. But what Nepalese people they did, uh, they replaced the title of Guega with this Guhe Samaj Tantra. So now it became like a manual as one of the ex, um, like a textbook for the Nepalese Buddhist, um, New Art Buddhist too. We must read this nine texts and it's include this Gwe Samadhi text. It's a very important text for the Bazar Sahari, the Tantric masters. And I have some, uh, so now we can uh, begin the question and answer session. And I will request, um, if you have any question, you can unmute and put forward your question. And please raise your hand. Uh, and I will, uh, if you have, please raise your hand. So before we begin, so I have one question. So this esoteric Tantra, is used to be so Indian Buddhist scholar they uh, treated as a yoga tantra. So why when it went to Tibet they classify as a uh, on Excel uh, yoga tantra? Like, why like the shift the change? The the history of uh, or the evolving of different classification schemes for uh, for for these scriptures starting especially uh, around the seventh century, beginning with, for example, the Vairochana, uh, Abhisambodhi, the uh, Sarva Tathagata Tattva Sangra, uh, is, is a very complex process. And it's only really later, as you said, in, in Tibet, where there is a, uh, a, a, a fairly systematic division into four classes of Tantra. That, that scheme doesn't seem to have been at least not consistently applied in India itself. The, the, 
way in which that uh, seems to have evolved has to do with whether there is uh, identification with the, the deity at the center of the mandala. Um, that seems to begin as a yoga tantra. Uh, you know, it, that's the first in, in, in instance of that. Uh, Guya Samaja has a lot in common uh, structurally with that, uh, with that text. And I think that my, my, my answer without even really knowing, but my, my, uh, my thought that comes to mind is that it is precisely the way that the commentarial reception in India that, uh, that, that advances the importance of that Guya Samaja um, and initially positions it or transit, transitions it, let's say, relabels it from Yoga Tantra to what they call Maha Yoga Tantra. So if you, in a sense, it's about branding, right? You know, it was like, well, you have your Yoga Tantras, but we have a big Yoga Tantra. We have a Maha Yoga Tantra. So there's some, there's some probably, uh, there's something to that as well, uh, sort of celebrating the greatness of it if it's if it's central to your tradition beyond that it, i i don't i can't say but we do know that in the dunhuang uh collection of tibetan texts that there there guya samaja is is there in manuscript form which puts it you know th th that's quite late uh ninth or tenth century text uh, at that point it is referred to as a maha Yo, uh, sorry, a, 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 a whatever, uh, yeah, Maha Yoga Tantra, excuse me. Um, so I think we can just generally say that there's a gen that there's a progression of promotion of the importance of certain texts, as you know, um, to to great to, to prominence. And there's one question from our audience. Uh, one one, do you want to ask by yourself? Okay, now I'll just read on. Padmasambhava brought Tantra, Tantra Buddhism to Tibet. So in Tibet practice, uh, Padmasambhava's teachings and mantra is the very important entrance. As such, Padmasambhava seems to have a higher attention or higher position than Sakyamuni Buddha. Is this situation, what are its advantages and disadvantages? Um, the, there, I won't say any, I can't speak specifically about Padmasambhava, but the emphasis, uh, and thank you for this, this question, because it brings up such a crucial point that the emergence of a Vajrayana set of uh, methods, which are Mah within Mahayana Buddhism, is in a certain way, in a certain sense, simply an extension of the Mahayana the Mahayana itself, which is very much inspired by a need to locate the Buddha in the world here and now. As the Buddha, historical Buddha, we, you know, is, is, is said to have been with his disciples as he's passing away and they're all lamenting and saying, what will we do without you, you know, once you are physically gone? And he says, you know, you, you should not, you, sh you should feel no sorrow because whoever sees the Dharma they see me. And this notion that the Dharma remains present in the world, of course, is an early uh, hint of what will eventually be called the Dharma Kaya, the Dharma body. And then even beyond that, that in expressions of the Dharma, such as books, for example, the Lotus Sutra, uh, the, the perfection of wisdom, they will refer to themselves as the body of Dharma. And extending that then to these traditions uh, of personal relationship with the teacher, it is, it is said and, 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 uh, and, and still, uh, I guess, prevalent and, and the standard idea of, of, is that the one's living teacher is, uh, is more important whether they if you had the good luck to you know spend time with Padmasambhava 
the fact that he was there physically present in your world makes him more important than the historical Buddha because you do not have access to him. So anywhere that the Dharma can be uh, articulated, that is the Dharma and that is the, the most precious thing. Without that, you would have no ability to, uh, to study or practice. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Lancaster had a question. Oh, Dr. Lancaster? Yeah, John, thank you so much. Um, I, I think um, you've, you've really shown us where the field has gone since uh, the old days when it was all black magic and <laughs> interpreted as such. I've become very, you know, I'm working on um, the Atlas of Maritime Buddhism these days. And in that, of course, is Palembang in Sumatra, where Atisha goes mm. to learn his Tantra. Have you thought much about uh, the fact that much of this spread to China through these maritime routes? And the thing which interested me from looking at the uh, biographies that have been written, I don't know how accurately they are, about Atisha, he said that he was taught that before you could do anything, you had to get the Prajnaparamita under your belt. Mm. What do you think about that? Is that you've described emptiness and all the things that appear in the price of Paramita. Just like your reaction to some of that. I, I uh, again, well, first of all, I, I have heard through Maroj about the, the Maritime Buddhist project that you're working on. I think that is, that is, that is so uh, interesting to me. It's compelling. It's, it, in a sense, it's a, I just want to celebrate that for a moment because it's it's almost like a recentering of world history, <laughs> uh, so that you know um, to to recognize this this the, the this uh, this network of not only of course Buddhism but uh, the 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 spread of of Sanskritic culture and status and I'm sure that those two things are are related throughout. You know, Indochina and and as far away as Indonesia, um, and we know, of course, that certain forms of that were 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 tantric forms or expressions of Buddhism. Uh, it seems to me like every idea that Chandrakirti and his other, as I said, their Arya tantric commentators work with and the very basis upon which they make these statements are grounded in the Krishna Paramita. Uh, and they are in a, in a, and even without necessarily making reference to some, you know, explicitly to Krishna Paramita, the idea of the omnipresence of the body of the Buddha, the idea that language itself is uh, the, the very articulation of, of sound is, is sort of the, you know, the Buddha speaking to us that the, that the syllable ah is the full expression of the Buddha. This I think is, is really uh, a, this is the, 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 the DNA of the, uh, the evolution I would say of of later Mahayana uh, tantric Buddhism or Vajrayana, um, and particularly this idea, uh, this this deconstructive idea, that you know emptiness is exactly what m makes dependent arising or relativity viable, uh, because it's so. And and you as a great you know uh, as a scholar of of early Mahayana, you know, uh, you know, one of the great scholars of the early Mahayana, 
I think it, you would appreciate the idea that, especially with what was going on in India, it's quite um, interesting that that the Buddhists never came up with an almighty creator God, <laughs> because it was all the rage. I mean, you know, this is the rise of uh, Vaishnava culture, of Shaiva culture, and the celebration or glorification of the Buddha as a as a you know being omnipresent you can see it would have been very tempting just to say, yeah, he's God, you know, he's, he, he did. <laughs> but because of it being grounded in the, uh, the, the, the voidness and relativity, the non-duality that is, that is described by Nagarjuna, um, it seems to have navigated its way past that. So no doubt in my mind, you know, the, even the idea of mantra that, that starts to be so important is spelled out so beautifully or talked about in the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. Uh, I was thinking too, in the Guhya Samaja, just as the Rajnaparamita text itself, uh, I think it's Ananda, I think it is maybe with Ananda being, he's, or Ananda speaking or either, or he's being spoken to and he's being told this book should be worshipped. This is the text of the Pajna Paramita with offerings. It is the guru. It is the teacher, you know, and so, and this is what was absolutely delight. I mean, is amazing to me about the Newari Buddhist tradition and how it maintains that, that, uh, that Pustaka Puja, that worship of the book. Uh, it, it was so moving to see that happening. I'm not sure of course, there are other traditions that do, you know, of course, the veneration of the Torah or the Quran. Uh, but in the Buddhist world, it's nothing like I'd ever seen before. It was so extraordinary. Um, yeah. Uh, related to that, it's, I guess, the last thing we have time for. The importance of the book itself as, a, as sort of the instantiation of the Buddha in, you know, within the world still. Um, there's also a story from Nalanda. It's told much later by Tibetan historians, but they, they tell the story that there was a, a, a fire. I think it was set by, you know, it usually has something to do with Tirtikas, with, with the, you know, marauding um, non-Buddhists who set fire to vandalize the great towering Ratnodadi, who they called uh, the, the library, the repository of, of knowledge at Nalanda. And the Guya Samaja Tantra text itself starts to sprout water. Wow. It's like a fire extinguishing system that gets, <laughs> you know, uh, so the, it, it, I just, I think that's very, uh, again, in, uh, to, to me that, that suggests an affinity with this much more, er, much earlier Mahayana idea of the of the preciousness of the of the book and and the and the contents of the book, of course. So you have the Lotus Sutra, with and and the recitation of Lotus Sutra, the even writing it, even seeing it, is becomes an extraordinary event. Uh, so I, I think that's a that's a wonderful. Uh, in fact, I was you know my own study of uh, of Mahayana scripture really came about in a backwards way because I was first studying uh, this this um, more tantric material, and the more that I look at it, the more that I see it, it is it's it, it's vast. <laughs> it is Vipulia, right? Mm. Right, Nirash. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> So we have. Uh, thank you very much. Of course, thank you. Thank you, Luke. Uh, any last question from student? If you have any question, you can ask the Dr. Gamba. I, I do. I do have a question, Dr. Campbell. Go for it. Uh, in in your description of what this text is, it's uh, you, you're saying that this is a um, in the Tibetan tradition. This text would represent um, contents that describe uh, the Buddha's um, 
the, the psychophysical uh, process of, of the Buddha's enlightenment and of enlightenment in general. Um, you can, is there an argument to say that, uh, that most Abhidhamma texts is, is competing in this realm that they're, the, the different traditions and different schools are trying to explain the psychophysical uh, process of, of awakening? And, and in that extent, would you say the, the, the entirety of Buddhist philosophy is Abhidhamic philosophy? Mm. Um, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. And, and yes, sometimes I even think, you know, the, 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 you know, the, 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 this final creative period of, of, the, of Indian Buddhism uh, with the production of tantras and, the, uh, and commentary on them is sort of a, uh, a renaissance of Abhidhamma, you know, uh, a return to that, obviously, but infused with, with different philosophical views that are typical. And the thing also, the engine behind all of this for coming out of the, the Mahayana tradition is, again, a way of talking about how does the Dharma actually remain in the world when a Buddha disappears, like what's actually happening. And so this development of an idea of uh, the, 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 the Dharma itself is, is a body, uh, the, the wisdom is a body, a wisdom body, but that there are also expressions of that. These are the emanation bodies or nirmanakayas. And then the Buddha's eternal enjoyment body or sambhogakaya. This then, you know, the idea that, and, and those ideas, you know, that are very old, they come, I mean, they're written about most, I believe, in things coming out of uh, the Maitreya Asanga uh, writings of uh, Abhisamaya Lankara, for example, which are in many respects very Abhidhamic because they talk about stages of bodhisattvas and they want to, they love their categories. But the, 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 the essence of it is that there are, that, that the Buddha doesn't, isn't, a, you know, his, his body, although it may appear to be flesh and blood, is actually something that has been fundamentally altered and remains in the world. The yogic practices that evolve uh, in later Mahayana and especially Vajrayana take it as they, they're starting from the premise that it is, in, you know, it is not for full, the full enlightenment of a being, it's not sufficient to only achieve the Dharma body, but an actual physical perfected body must be also achieved. And that has to happen through these extraordinary methods of, of, uh, of practice. Um, I also am not knowledgeable enough about the Abhidhamic tradition, but um, I think this is an amazing, uh, amazing observation I, that uh, this concern for within Abhidhamma, how to, how the mind works and how it transforms as it becomes, um, as, as awakening occurs, but whether or not it talks about anything sort of the, the bodhisattva ideal of remaining present within cyclic existence. I, I honestly don't know. Uh, and that's something we could talk about. You could tell me all about it. I, I just think it's, it's how fascinating the diversity of, of infusion and harmonization of cultural ideas have, have uh, have, have taken place and allow us to have these conversations and, and, and now having a conversation 2,600 years later about, about what the Buddha's experience was, now we get to talk about it in psychological terms. That's right. That's right. It's so rich. It's so rich. And then, you know, the network of, say, maritime Buddhism that flourished, uh, you know, 15, I don't know, I'm going to guess here, starting 1,500 years ago, well, what do we have right in front of us right now? We have a network of transmission of ideas and I think we're all at least 3000 miles apart and some of us may be more. Um, it's, uh, the, the, this process continues. I think it's wonderful, uh, so. Thank you, Dr. Campbell, for a wonderful talk. And, uh,
I don't know, despite your busy schedule, you gave some, you came to give a speech. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Thank before you we end, much. I just want to announce that um, so next week, um, Tuesday, Dr. Lancaster is going to give a talk. The topic is wisdom, and it's a very important uh, topic. I hope you all can join. And then another interesting uh, lecture the schedule on um, Tuesday, 27th um, April, 2 p.m., uh, Dr. Ian Sinclair. So he's an expert in Indo Tibetan Buddhism, too. Uh, so he will give a talk on the new art. The topic is the religiosity of new art Buddhism, Mahayana or Tantric Sawaka. And I think Dr. Lankasa before mentioned about the uh, Sumatra stuff. So he will also cover some, he's, he's doing research on the Sumatra and the Atisa's teachers. And so you can ask questions about that. Right? So I hope you all will join. And thank you. Once again, I would like to thank President Todd, Dr. Eva Mora and Srinanda, Pong, Sam for their support and encouragement. And thank you everyone for attending. Stay safe. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you all for coming. Very happy to see you.